So if the people who built the Parthenon had, among other things in mind, the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, that having been, up until the time of the construction of the Parthenon, the largest temple in mainland Greece, and so the new standard, uh, then as the Parthenon was rising on the Acropolis in Athens, folks down at Olympia were probably thinking, huh. <laughs> and among the aspects of the Parthenon that could have drawn their attention in terms of how they could then make some modifications to their temple, what would have impressed them the most? What are all of the parts of the adornment of the Parthenon that we have now elucidated? There's the frieze. What else? Pediments. Pediments on both ends. What else? Metopes, all 92 of them. What else? I'm talking about another category of sculpture. Another category of deco. The gold and ivory Athena on the inside. Now, once a temple is built, adding more architectural sculpture is complicated. You have to actually do some dismantling. And the architectural sculpture of the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, that is a very precise and calibrated program. So it's hard to imagine the people at Olympia saying, oh, we've got to make a new and improved version here. I, I, would, I would think that from their point of view, the version they had was better already. The cult statue, however, that's a different story. The sculptor of the, or the master sculptor in charge of the program of the Parthenon was a man named Phidias, P-H-E-I-D-I-A-S. And it was he who designed and oversaw the execution of the cult statue of Athena Parthenos in the Parthenon, the magnificent, enormous gold and ivory, well, gold-plated bronze and ivory statue. And almost as soon as his work was completed in Athens, the Elians hired him to make a similar cult statue, this time of Zeus, not Athena, for the temple of Zeus at their site. Now, what were the dimensions of the Parthenon? How many columns across the front <coughs> and back? You remember? Eight. Eight by 17. What are the dimensions of the Temple of Zeus? Column-wise? You can count here. <laughs> Six by 13. You know, this is the formula for a Greek temple, should you be interested in building one. Two X times 2X plus 1. If x are the number of columns across the front and the back, 2x plus 1 are the number of columns down the flanks. So 6 by 13, 8 by 17. Why is the Parthenon uh, a bit bigger? Well, in part to make it bigger than the Temple of Zeus, but in part to accommodate that cult statue, which was very, very large. Now, the cult statue of Athena was standing. She's a standing figure. We know this from, from representations, some of which were made shortly thereafter, the way that you can go and buy a little key ring or, or token of the Statue of Liberty in New York, well, you could get you know, little figurines of the Athena Parthenos um, in Athens and, and elsewhere. So we know what the Athena Parthenos looked like, although the statue itself, of course, is gone. She was standing. She was very, very large. Uh, there wasn't really that much room inside the cella of the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. So um, Phidias had to uh, make a statue that was seated. The Elians were very proud of it and almost immediately began putting it on their coins on the heads, or the obverse side of the coins, was the head of the statue, and on the reverse, or the tail side of the coins, was the seated statue. Ancient observers, among them Strabo, a geographer uh, who lived in uh, the first century AD, or CE, observed uh, visiting 
the sanctuary of Zeus at Olympia and seeing the cult statue inside that were he to stand, he would take the roof off the temple. <laughs> he was enormous, the largest cult statue of a god uh, made for a Greek temple and uh, magisterial, seated uh, with a victory, Niki, in one outstretched hand. And uh, he was soon thereafter by, by Hellenistic scholars living in Alexandria who were very impressed with the Greek world whose culture they had inherited and made lists of impressive things, including a list that we know of as the seven wonders of the ancient world. That was the product of Hellenistic, proud Hellenistic scholars, um, named the statue of Zeus in the Temple of Zeus at Olympia as one of those seven wonders. Nothing in Athens was named one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, which you can just imagine really teed off the Athenians. That could not have been good. Um, so there is this sense in the 5th century BCE of slightly different takes on all sorts of things. How to situate um, oneself vis-a-vis -vis the cataclysmic events of the day, the Persian Wars, the Greek victory, the um, generational shift in power, the ascendancy of especially Athens, the perhaps over-proud manner of the Athenians, how one was to regard oneself vis-a-vis -vis the great stories of the day, and especially the stories of the heroes. And you can imagine thinking about the contrast between Olympia and Athens, Katie, that uh, there were different ways of thinking about the place of people, men and women. What's one of the things that these sculptures, all from the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, of course, have in common. Okay, think about some things that they have in common. You can, you can have a quick chat. Whenever there's a lot of silence, I figure you need to talk. <laughs> Okay, something that they have in common. Yep. <laughs> kind of down. Um, let's elaborate on that. So, so in general, what would what would you say about that? They're showing emotion. They all show emotion, right? So the emotion happens to be sad <laughs> in, in their case, or worried uh, in, in the case of the seer. Actually, I w down is a, oh, not a helpful word because they're all, they're all emoting each in their own way. So the seer is worried. Heracles here from the Metope of the Nemean Lion is tired. <laughs> and he's... Well, he might be a little down thinking about the next 11 labors to go. <laughs> and uh, the Lapith here, actually, he's the one from the biting group. So he's in pain. <laughs> his, his arm, the, the, the centaur has just sunk his teeth into this fellow's arm. So, uh, it, uh, but the little furrows on their, on their brow um, uh, and the cast of their head, and the, and the placement of their hands all combine to convey emotion. They all show emotion. As opposed to the participants, the Athenians themselves, on the Parthenon. So here are two mounted riders from the frieze. And you 
could even almost think that they are related to one another. There is this generalized expression. Let's have some adjectives to describe the expression on the faces of the participants of the Parthenon freeze. Give me an adjective that would describe them. Serious? Give me another one. Uh, somber. somber? Give me another one. Uh, solemn. solemn. Stoic, Con concerned as in worried, focus, that's a good one. Give me another one. Concentrated. And all of those, and, and I agree with all of those, I think that, that all of those are appropriate they are fixed. They are kind of resolute. It is an all-purpose expression, you could almost say. You can read almost whatever you want into it. It's very, it, it's, it's very stable, so it only shifts with how you're feeling as, as you look at it. It's you have to do the work to engage, which makes them, in addition, something else, and that is aloof. And that, in addition, makes them on the uh, wavering between a real and an ideal persona because they are distanced not just spatially but by this very otherly fixed view that they have they're not engaging with with you at all if the Heroes and men and uh, and all the participants on the temple of Zeus at Olympia are made all the more real by the actual emotion they show, the specific events into which they've been inserted. The participants on the Parthenon are ideal, real ideal. It's a constant tug. It's, it's uh, two ends of a pendulum that swing back and forth all the time. It's not always completely absolute, although sometimes the, the pendulum keep, keeps on going in one direction or another. And you can think of this application today, you can think about advertisements, TV shows. I mean, what what are what is the current craze for reality programming? Is that your reality? <laughs> I don't know anybody who has a reality like reality TV. That's a very funny use of the word reality if you stop to think about it. But we're supposed to identify with that in a way that you know none of us might have identified with. I don't know. Charlie's Angels. <laughs> I I don't. I, News flash. I don't actually own a television set, so I don't even know what current TV programs are. But um, back in the day, there was this program called Charlie's Angels, and those ladies, they were not real. <laughs> they were played by real people, but they were not real. So, so there's this constant back and forth between these poles, and you can see that discussion right here on the screen in front of you. You can see those two points of view between the ways in which. Uh, the, the, the people who designed and executed these great programs, these billboards uh, to publicize the, their, the sites and, the, and these stories um, took, took their, their tack. Now, in Athens, there has been, for well over 100 years, this very um, busy potter's quarter. 
So there, there are lots of artisans in Athens, not just sculptors. And the um, potters in the potter's quarter have continued to make vases. They've continued to paint pots for household use, for daily use. And just as in the 6th century BCE, the subjects and the styles and the scenes on the pots reflected what the people who bought the pots wanted to see. It was a buyer's market, not a seller's market. I mean, you have to make a pot that somebody is interested in purchasing, if you're a potter. You want to paint on it uh, subjects and scenes that, that people are interested in. So in the middle of the 5th century, the ideal view, this calm, focused, resolute, serious, kind of multi-purpose, polyvalent expression, or you almost could say also expressionless, ideal, uh, was popular not just um, in sculpture, but it, it filtered down to um, the people who were decorating vases at the time. So you see here, almost certainly, uh, the hero Achilles, and he appears on uh, a red figure amphora that was painted right around the same time that the Parthenon sculptures were going up. Um, the painter is identified as the Achilles painter. We don't have his name, and this is his name, Vase. And this is very interesting. What's Achilles doing? Yeah, nothing. He's standing there. Now, who's Achilles again? Who is this guy? Hero. A hero of the Trojan War. And what is he a hero for? What is his claim to fame? Is it standing around? How do you know this is Achilles? He's not in action. What's the point of a hero just standing around? What makes this worthy of presentation? Think about the heroes that we've seen. Heracles engaged in all his labors. Uh, the heroes of Agena on the Temple of Aphaea at Agena in the heat of battle, Theseus on the Athenian treasury fighting. Action. We've seen action. Heroes in action. What makes a hero for the Athenians in the middle of the 5th century BCE? You might want to have a small chat. Have a small chat. I know. I fooled around with the color, but I couldn't I couldn't get the yellow. Out enough. I guess I could fool around with it a little bit more. <laughs> okay, all the way in the back there. What do you think? Absolutely. Uh, maybe it's the way of like showing that the heroes are kind of like that way, sort of making heroes like I think that there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. I think that there is clearly an identification, um, a, an easy back and forth identification between how a hero looks and how the Athenians on the frieze look, which of course ennobles and elevates the Athenians themselves. This can be no accident. Um, but the Athenians on the Parthenon frieze are actually doing something. 
So what's 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 up here? What what is the Achilles painter saying to you? So you go into the potter's quarter, you're going to have a party, you're looking for a new painted amphora to put in the middle of the table in the dining room at the party, and you see this, and you think either, yeah, I like that, or you think, huh, <laughs> that's really boring. <laughs> Somebody must have liked it. Probably a few people. This is not the only such kind of scene. It is a very, very good point that times have changed. Times have changed. The Athenians at, at this moment are not at war. That's, that's absolutely correct. On the other hand, you know, there are scenes of um, mythical scenes, um, scenes with Achilles, for example, on the Francois Think way back. On the Francois in the early 6th century, there were lots of essentially commentaries on what it meant to be a hero. There was Peleus and the Caledonian boar hunt. That was the top freeze. There was Achilles at Troy chasing down Troilus. Remember that great scene where you just, he, he is on foot and Troilus is on a horse escaping and Achilles is overtaking him. That's how you know he's a hero. He's a, a, as, as fast as a running horse. That's how you know he's a hero in the 6th century BCE. What makes this guy a hero? He doesn't have to fight. He has as much of a weapon in his mind as in his hand. What else? What else? He's prepared. Has his he has a spear? Focused. <laughs> he, he looks strong. He looks able. But he also looks calm. I mean, he doesn't look belligerent. It can't be only about his brain or he wouldn't be armed. It can't be only about his arms, or he'd be looking a little more alert. <laughs> a little more tense, let's say. And he doesn't. You know what I almost, I almost did, but I have so many things I want you guys to talk about today. I didn't want to get distracted. But what I, th what I really wanted to do was put up a picture of that, that great 1950s picture of James Dean. You know what I'm talking about, Jane? <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about? If you had to come up with a hero image for today, would it be somebody in action? Or would it be somebody in repose? What, what is the point of this image? Uh, so everything that's been said so far is good, but there's got to be more. What do you think? How would this speak to Athens at this moment? How would this speak to an Athenian at this moment? I think it's a statement about peace and peacefulness. And our heroes don't need to be in motion now. They can do And we've attained some calm. Because the city is not at war. As, as has been pointed out. So this time is different. And in 
times of peace, arms are not the primary thing, and you need reason, and you need wisdom, and you need calm, and you need focus, you need to be prepared. Why do you need heroes at all if everything's going so great? What's the attraction of Achilles to an Athenian in the middle of the 5th century BC? He gets, so he's still an ideal. He gives them something to strive for, or he gives them something to identify with. <laughs> Can be both, absolutely. It's not either or. But one of the reasons that when you walk into that pottery shop and you, your eye falls on this, you might think, oh, that's just the thing. All of that. That is how Achilles is known in the Iliad. You, you all remember. He is called the best of the Achaeans. Who did the Athenians think they were anyway now? <laughs> At the same time, a sculpt, oh, not all sculpture appears up on, uh, on buildings. There's a lot of freestanding sculpture around. We don't, I don't show you that much in this class, primarily because Mr. Pedley shows you so much in uh, his book that I figured you're covered. <laughs> but um, the stance of Achilles on the Achilles painter Amphora here is absolutely, definitely a copy of what was the most famous sculpture in ancient Greece. How do we know? A, because lots of ancient writers refer to it. B, because the man who sculpted it, Polycleitus, wrote a book about it, a little treatise. And C, because we've got more Roman copies of it than practically any other sculpture that we have from antiquity. So it was really popular for a long, long time. And that sculpture is the Doryphoros, or spear bear. Doryphoros means spear bear. Doros is spear for, for all is to, I bear, you bear, to bear. And so he is the spear bearer, and he is likely also Achilles. Although he, of course, could be, could be anybody. He is a, a far cry from the last time we looked in any detail at uh, freestanding sculpture. Here is uh, Croesus, the grave marker for a man named Croesus, or what we also know of as the Anavisos Koros. The Anavisos Koros um, is animated. He has the smile on his face. He's in motion. The Doryphoros is in motion but stilled. He is arrested in motion. He is completely balanced between um, activity and repose. So his, uh, his right arm is relaxed. His left arm is tensed because it's holding a spear. Conversely, uh, while his right arm is relaxed, his right leg carries his body weight. And his left leg against his left arm which his left arm is tense and his left leg is free. There's no, there's no weight on it. It's not a weight-bearing leg. All the weight is, is uh, on his other leg. So, so he's 
opposites here, and he's opposites here, he's opposites here, and opposites here. So that poise and counterpoise, the, um, the sculptural jargon word for this is contrapposto, which means poise and counterpoise in Italian. <laughs> but because it sounds so much better to say in an Italian than to say poise and counterpoise, that's what we call it, we call it the pose contrapposto. And the flow of movement travels up in uh, two kinds of sort of curved lines through his body. And yet, all of that is held in stillness. The essential ambiguity of the Doriferos, is he moving? Is he standing? Has he just been stopped? Is he just about to start? That essential ambiguity is absolutely reflected in the essential ambiguity of who he is. Is he an ideal? Or is he real? He looks real. You know, he looks very real. Polyclitus does a great job here. This is a Roman copy, of course. We don't have the original. This happens to be a pretty good one. Um, the original would have absolutely been a bronze. Uh, the copies are in marble, and uh, in marble, they're less stable, so these Roman copies all have these absolutely horrific struts um, of various sorts. One's uglier than the next. <laughs> uh, so you have to ignore that. There is um, a fragment of a Doriferos in the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. If you have not gone to see it, you should. It's in the middle of the rotunda on the second floor. It's one of their prized, prized pieces. It's, it's just... Um, He's headless, sadly. Um, so no head, and I think he's cut off at the knees. You just have the, the main part of the torso, but it, there, it can be nothing else but the Doriferos because of all of the, um, the angling of the planes of the body and the, and the balance and the counterbalance. So it's very cool. You, 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 should, all, you should all go see it. Um, so he looks very real. Bone, muscle, flesh, sinew, hair, the structure of his face. These are precisely observed. But just like the figures on the Parthenon frieze, just like the uh, figure of Achilles on the red figure amphora that we just saw, he has this essentially blank expression onto which you can attach whatever interpretation you want. And that aloofness removes him from your plane of interaction. Um, this was absolutely, this pose, this persona, this expression, this type, this was the ideal in the middle and third quarters of the 5th century BCE in Athens. And we see it over and over again. So here is, this is a new kind of pot painting that I haven't talked to you about before. It's called white ground. It's very cool. So uh, what the pot painters do is put a white wash of paint over the vessel, and then they have a canvas that they simply paint on top of. They don't have to do any outlining. And uh, so this um, particular vase is what's called a lekathos. It's a little oil jar. It's actually not that little. Um, and uh, there's a scene on it. And it's, the scene again here is Achilles. And uh, he is holding out his helmet. And he's holding on to a uh, shield. And there's his spear. And again, you know, all his weight's on one leg and the opposite arm is the, is the one with the weight. So you have the same um, contrapposto pose and, and tension um, with Achilles on this vase as you do with the Doriferos. Uh, Achilles looks like he's talking to somebody or looking at somebody. He's handing his helmet over to somebody. And indeed, he's handing his helmet over to a lady. What scene from the Iliad would this be? Anybody remember any scene where Achilles says, bye, mom, or hi, honey, I'm leaving, I'm home, see you later. Twenty-four books of the Iliad. 
Any scenes take place in the home? I know that each of you is thinking, let's see, book one, no scenes in the home. Book two, no scenes in the home. <laughs> OK, I'll tell you, no. So what's going on here? <sighs> Do you need to have another little chat? <laughs> What's going on here? It's kind of like a scene like uh, Achilles and Ajax, where it's like a made-up scene that like, expresses. Right. The, that is an excellent analogy. You guys all remember the great vase by Ezekias with Achilles and Ajax playing checkers or dice or something. Yeah, I guess they're playing dice because they're throwing and there's numbers. So yeah, that can't be checkers. Um, anyway, they're playing a game. No scene like that. What does this concept do to a hero? What does this do to your, to your heroes? It personalizes them. Absolutely. It humanizes them. It brings them closer to you. What was the trajectory of Heracles in the metopes of the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. To whom does Heracles get closer? Uh, the gods. And at the end of that metope cycle, what is the reward of Heracles? Deification. On the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, heroes are for inspiration. They rise. And what about the heroes in Athens in the middle of the 5th century? What is their utility to the Athenians? What is their utility to the Athenians? Is this a role? What's he doing that's so impressive? What's going on? So if Heracles on the Temple of Zeus at Olympia is an inspiration because this is what heroes do. They strive. They, Im they embody excellence. They achieve. They vanquish. They ultimately, or at least Heracles, ascend. That's not how heroes are used in Athens in the third quarter of the fifth century. <coughs> so what are the Athenians doing? They're realizing the heroes and having to relate to them more than their personal lives. Yeah. I'm sure guys can relate to like coming home from work and be like, what's up? I don't know. Right. They're, so these, are, these her heroes are us. These are heroes you can relate to, right? These are humanized heroes. These are not inspiring heroes. These are everyday heroes. They are in everyday scenes. Is this not completely of a piece with the sculptural program of the Parthenon? when you think about it. Because the sculptural program of the Parthenon has Athena and Poseidon, the birth of Athena, those are the two pediments, Trojanomachy, Amazonomachy, Centauromachy, Gigantomachy on the Metopes. And who's on the frieze? The Athenians. Nice company they keep, eh? Well, why not? 
if this is your idea of a hero, it's not really a very far step. There's another interesting thing that's going on in the third quarter of the fifth century in Athens, middle to third quarter, and that is that the ladies are starting to appear again. We've missed them. <laughs> We've had a lot of guys. I don't know if you've been keeping track. <laughs> On the little gender equity scale, we were doing fine in the geometric and the early archaic. We had monumental sculptures in Icandri and... Uh, and, and actually, in the, on the vase paintings, we had everyday scenes with women, like the weavers weaving lacathos from the Amasis painter, and uh, the girls were doing okay. Why is that? Who was Nicandri? Remember Nicandri? Yeah, she's that long, she's that tall, plank like lady. Okay. So. How is Nicandri worthy of being depicted in gigantic sculptural format? Remember the inscription on her? What's her claim to fame? In and of herself, she's so important. We have important ladies in the geometric and archaic, early archaic periods. Uh, the Dipolon Amphora. What was the Dipolon Amphora? Yeah, so it's a monumental marker for a female burial. We had the wealthy woman back in the 9th century BC, that Athenian burial. So women, women were both important. They had money and a presentation or representation of them, monumentalization, recognition of them, all of those things occurred. Why? They have equal rights for women in the 8th century BCE in Athens, and then those equal rights got taken away? You think? Who were those women, and why did they rate that kind of attention and treatment? They were elite. And what, do you think we don't have any elite women anymore? Who are the elite in Athens now? Do we have elite in Athens? Oh, do we? What's the governmental system in Athens right now? Democracy. Who's a citizen? Anybody else? No. <laughs> so democracy, good for Western civilization, not so good for women in Greece. Women were not citizens. Until the third quarter of the fifth century. Women don't become citizens then, but a new law is passed in Athens that if uh, you're born to a free woman of an Athenian or a, a family that belongs to one of the Athenian tribes, you are automatically a citizen. Citizenship, in other words, can come down through your mother's line or your father's line. It's a new law that gets passed. And at that time, in the third quarter of the fifth century, guess what? We start to see women again in sculpture. Regular women, not just deities. So what you've been looking at up here on the, uh, on the screen is Artemis from these frieze of the Parthenon. Her pose is not too dissimilar from um, whoever this is, uh, it's Achilles' mom or girlfriend or sister or something, um, on the, on the Lekathos. Uh, this, of course, a deity because on the Parthenon there are, the, the women are, um, deities. But now we start to see women um, in their home and daily life. So here, for example, red figure. This is, this is um, an epinetron, which is a very wacky vase that this is um, 
hollow, and there's an open end here, and you put it over your <laughs> you put it over your knee, and you um, can uh, if you're if you're um, carding wool or 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 doing some kind of activity domestic activity in the house uh, where you're sitting down and you um, uh, you know you have to protect your your leg so look, carding wool is, is a good one because you might be beating something against your leg so this is a decorated version of what must there must have been more utilitarian versions of these sorts of vessels so it's a woman's vessel um, and it's decorated with uh, a, a cute scene of uh, wedding preparations. Where uh, does this take place? There's some, there's some architecture. Where, where are you supposed to assume this is taking place? Is this a temple? In a home, right, it's in a home, it's in a home. So that's interesting, isn't it? There's a column here. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Um, so, this, so this is just to remind you of the kind of um, visual world that somebody living in the, third, in the third quarter of the fifth century in Athens would have been involved in. Um, if you see a bunch of people just kind of hanging around up on public buildings, those, so for example, uh, on the East Frieze of the Parthenon, they would be men, like these magistrates that are on the East Frieze of the Parthenon. But now, at least in um, domestic goods for, for the household, in, in domestic, women are starting to, uh, starting to get equal time. Okay. In a house, where's this? Remember this place? Ooh. Look it up. Come on. When's the last time you saw a house? You read a little article about this. You wrote a little report about this. How soon we forget. Did you find it? You didn't even look. Yeah. You just wait for it. You just piggybacking. <laughs> it is Zagora. Zagora courtyard houses, 700 BCE. You read an article. What was the point of that article? The development of the courtyard house. And why? Because you could then have uh, different parts of the house. So you have courtyards. And uh, working areas, so, so here's an open place, there's storage, storage, right? So these are other rooms off the courtyard. But then all the drinking cups and stuff came from these rooms, also um, accessed directly from the courtyard, or in this case from an ante room into the, um, from the courtyard into an ante room and then into it. And uh, the point of the article, who wrote that article now? It wasn't Andy Stewart, it was, uh, was Ian Morris, Ian Morris. Uh, Mr. Morris's point was that this is the beginning of what um, we take for granted as a typical Greek house. This was the place that we could first identify the shift. And indeed, um, though it's, that's the sort of house now quite elaborated, that we see, for example, in, in Athens and elsewhere in the uh, later part of the 5th and the 4th centuries BCE. So we see um, houses, now they're larger, they're a little more elaborate, now they have um, bigger columns, similar to uh, perhaps the one that we saw on the vase that you were just looking at, but the parts of the house, um, the crucial parts of the house are still the same. So you have a courtyard. You have a specialty room or a dining room. Um, and then the other working rooms are off the courtyard in another direction. Same thing. 
Um, okay, wedding preparations, houses, life. Let's go to death. <laughs> uh, we're in the Karamikus in Athens. This is near the. Um, this is the area of the Dipylon. This has been a cemetery for the city of Athens since Athens was refounded after the collapse at the end of the Bronze Age. Um, and it was uh, an area where all sorts of burials occurred, poor, middle class, and wealthier. If you were poor, um, you could have just had a small grave, that is uh, a, a, a small pit or cyst in the ground, and brought to that grave, and maybe a tiny little stone marker, and brought to that grave would have been vases like this. Lekathoi, white ground, so just like the one that we saw from the Achilles painter. Mr. Pedley talks about these in his book. White ground lekathos, and frequently the scene on the lekathos would be the scene of a funeral. So here, for example, you see um, the, the dead person, the corpse, being carried, and by, here's, you have to assume in real life they would have had clothes on. Um, and probably about to be buried down here. And he is being placed in front of a stele, a tall stone marker that may or may not have actually existed, but is being depicted in, in this format. And here you see a close-up of, a, of one, another such um, marker built up of individual stones. And a, a sad-looking tree is um, craftily drawn so that it gives you this melancholy sense of spring and fall and time passing and so on. And, and collected around the base of the stele are, are more lekithoi. Draw, they're drawn here, just little drawings of lekithoi, the vases in the same shape as here. So that would have been uh, a poor person's burial. Here's, here's another such, another white ground lekithos, and a lady very sadly is walking away, looking sadly at the stele um, that marks the grave of her loved one. But also in the Karamikus, there were standing, large, stone funerary markers. And just the way that today you can go into a cemetery, or actually more likely an old cemetery like from the 19th century, and see lots of different styles of grave markers, big, small, with sculptures, just with words, with little scenes sculpted in, um, with objects. So too, in Athens, you could see different sorts of markers. So um, some people went for taller. Some people went for pictures. And of course, all of the people who would have done anything like this would have been, would have been wealthy people. So uh, the marker that you see here, found in the Karamikus in Athens, is, uh, is a very famous one. Um, and uh, we know who it belongs to because there's an inscription across the top. Uh, it belongs to a lady named Higaso. She's in your, she's in your book. Um, H-E-G-E-S-O. And she actually looks a lot like Artemis from the East Frees, you know. And, and probably one of the things that was going on in Athens at this time is, you know, there were all those sculptors that had been working on the top of the Acropolis, and then in 432, they were out of work. That was not good. You know, they, and you can just imagine that they want to ply their trade. They don't want to just go back to live on the farm. And they've got this great line item on their CV. I made Parthenon Metope South 27. <laughs> you could hire me to make the grave marker for your loved ones. And so we get lots of grave markers now for, for the next couple of generations in Athens. And um, there are all sorts of scenes. So here Higaso is um, taking an item out of a jewelry box. And she's got a, a, a servant looking at her. Um, she is shown as a matron, m young or middle-aged matron, which is no reflection on the age she was when she died. We don't have any idea how old she was when she died. And just the way that you can look at pictures in obituaries today, and sometimes the picture will be recent, and sometimes the picture will not be recent. So sometimes you'll see a picture of somebody 
when they were, you know, in the service in their 20s. And then you read the obituary and the age that they died at was 80. So pe people choose to be, or their families choose to have them remembered in, in all sorts of ways. But these are remarkable for the same reason that the Achilles amphora is remarkable. What sort of female has been shown in life-size sculpture up until now? Goddesses. This is not a venue for regular folk, but now it is. The distance between the divine and the mortal has effectively collapsed. With this wholly ironic corollary, gods don't die. How can you best evince the immortal in a mortal, portray them at a scale, in a style, in a pose reserved for deities, even though the point is a gravestone? I forgot I put that up there. He goes to wife of Proxenus. Just like Nicandri, wife of, yeah. <laughs> what makes her matter? Uh, so we were going to have a little conversation about the similarities between these two, but we're not because I want to get on to this very interesting final thing that we have to do um, before Tuesday because now you're going to go home and write your papers, and Tuesday we're going to have this interesting discussion. So I'm going to press ahead, um, but I know that you are all thinking the right thing, which is it's monumental, it's for a woman, it's in the, it's on display, so it's it's obvious, and uh, she must she must also be they they both must be from wealthy families, um, and they are representatives of their family and their class. Um, and in that way, they are, although of course visually quite dissimilar, functionally essentially identical. Um, we have a lot of these gravestones, just a lot, and they are, they're touching and they're beautiful and they're evocative um, and they're emotionally rich, and we can't talk about any of them. Um, but I will post the PowerPoint and PDF, and then you can you can take a look at them. And Mr. Pedley talks about these um, in in some detail in in his book. So um, there are scenes, household scenes. There are a lot of there are a lot of these gravestones with women. It's very interesting. Um, now all of a sudden, so uh, here's a, a woman. She's adjusting her veil, and it's either her daughter or her maidservant with her. Um, here's one who is receiving her infant. Perhaps she died in childbirth. And that's what's being um, captured in, in this scene. And there are also frequently family scenes, either a husband and a wife um, or uh, a threesome. And increasingly, there are scenes that um, have what, what's called the handshake uh, or the cl clasped hands pose. And one of the interesting things about these gravestones is that they all show emotion. So emotion, that pendulum now, a generation and two generations after the Parthenon, that pendulum has swung back. Because pendulums are for swinging. They just, they're not good at standing still. So after a while, that ideal, serene, aloof, composed, focused, otherworldly persona was yesterday. 
And now it's about how you feel and how you can show how you feel, how you can convey that. That has come back. Um, very interesting gravestone in the Karamikas um, is, is this one here, which, again, in my fantasies, we were really going to have, I guess I thought we were going to have about twice as long today to talk than we actually have. Um, so uh, I'm going to rush over this one as well. This is um, a, a gravestone which has a big inscription on it. Dexalaeus, uh, son of Lysanias of Thoricos, that's one of the deems of Attica. Uh, he was born um, in the Archonship of Tysandros, which is, I wrote this down someplace. What did I do with that piece of paper? Ooh, I left it. It's about, he's born about 414. 414, 413, I think. He died in the Archonship of Eubelodes at Corinth. There was a little skirmish, a little war between Athens and Corinth. The, uh, the war took place in the year 394. So he's, he's in his 20s. He died in his 20s in war. Uh, one of five cavalrymen. And um, this, is, um, this is somebody who studied the Parthenon frieze who made the gravestone for Dexalaos because um, here, for example, is one of the riders from the West Frieze of the Parthenon, and you can see uh, the exact same sort of pose, um, cloak, flying, um, or here, uh, a Parthenon metope now used for good. So here, a centaur beating a lapith, but, uh, you know, those horsey bodies, very handy for the pose thing. So here again, you know, you've got a rearing, rearing body, although this time the horse has his own head instead of a man's head. Um, figure down, figure down, but... So these, these compositions can be, um, can be copied and, and used to other ends. All right. Middle of the 4th century, now in the middle of the 4th century, or second quarter of the 4th century, the Persians, you know, uh, the Persians have not gone away. They've just stopped bothering the Greeks. They are still in charge of the largest land empire of antiquity. Greece is still small. Persia is still vast. They just have agreed to leave each other alone. Politically and militarily, culturally, however, there's lots of back and forth. The Persians had a system of governance where they had sort of provinces, which they called satrapies. One of the satrapies was Mysa over here in Ionia. One was uh, Lydia. And one was Caria. Caria is a satrapy. And there was a uh, satrap. He was the guy in charge of the satrapy. Um, and the capital of the satrap of Halicarnassus, uh, of Caria, was in Halicarnassus, modern Bodrum, and you're admiring it here. That was the capital city of the satrapy of ancient Caria. And the satrap was named Mausolus, M A U. S-O-L-E-U-S. And Mausolus prepared in advance for the inevitability of his demise and hired architects and sculptors from Greece to build a monumental burial place for him, which we know of as the mausoleum of Halicarnassus. And our modern term mausoleus, mausoleum is derived from the mausoleum, which is the burial place of Mausolus, the satrap of Caria. We have a description of the mausoleum of Halicarnassus in an ancient author, Pliny. It's quite detailed. Uh, we know about the size of it. It was about 150 feet high. It was about 125 square feet. It was a big square. It was on a high podium. There were almost six levels. There was relief sculpture or around at least two or three parts. There were freestanding sculptures. There were colonnades at the top. There was a pyramidal roof, a roof in the shape of a pyramid. Where's the idea from a pyramid come from? Egypt, right, just checking to make sure you're with me here. And there was a quadriga, four-horse chariot, on the top of monumental sculpture. Not uh, too much of the mausoleum has survived, but parts of the foundation have been excavated, and fragments of the sculpture have been found. 
mostly fragments of the relief sculpture, um, and the ancient authors who talk about it testify to the names of some of the sculptors, including some of the most famous Greek sculptors, that is, sculptors from the mainland of Greece, of the day, including Skopas. Skopas was one of the, the big hotshots of the 4th century BC, sculpture-wise. Um, the sculpture is pretty impressive. You can see a lot of it, a lot of the relief sculpture today in uh, the British Museum. The at least one of the friezes was a battle scene. What's the subject of this battle scene? What's the subject of this battle scene? Okay, you got lucky. <laughs> Who are the combatants? Men and women. What battle must this be? Amazonomachy. Very good. See, you knew that. You just had to step by step get to it out. Amazonomachy, Greek myth. Greek sculptors, Greek myth, Greek style. Um, very syncopated, very regular. Um, you see the, all of these little individual triangular compositions. This one's going to be like this. Here, here. Here, <laughs> and then this one here, and then a little sort of emphasis point there. So, um, so they are very, they are very cute. Uh, all right. So here's another detail. Here's Mausolus. This is from almost certainly the group that was at the top. He is ten feet. Nine inches high. This sculpture, not mausolus. <laughs> Ten feet nine inches high. Here's my question Is the mausoleum of Halicarnassus? Greek. Is it Greek art? Is it a Greek monument? Discuss. A week would be good if we could do it. Mm -hmm. I think we can do it. Okay. <coughs> yeah. It should be pretty straightforward to grade. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I devised them so that they would be straightforward to grade. <laughs> I'm always worried about that. Yeah. It's all about them doing work, not us doing work. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's not the idea. Okay, out of curiosity, first let's just have a fast show of hands. The mausoleum of Halicarnassus is Greek, like it belongs in a class like this. Hands up. Mausoleum of Halicarnassus is not Greek. Hands up. A definite minority. A definite minority. All right. Things that are Greek about the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus. Go. Relief sculpture. In what way? The subject, Amazonomachy. The style was... It's pretty similar to other sorts of relief sculpture that we've that we've seen. The fact that it tells a story and it's put on a building, so just even that fact alone, that's Greek. And the sculptors apparently were Greek. What else is Greek about it? So so Mausolus looks Greek. Is that right? You think the expression looks the same? What's it look the same as? 
Let's let 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 me ask this in a different let me ask this in a different way. Who's this? Is he somebody that you could have dinner with? <laughs> okay, so he's not real. I mean, he's not a real person. He looks like a real person, not a real person. This, real person. On the other hand, of course, this is a real person. He, on the other hand, has a very completely unindividualized face. Unindividualized, unindividualized. Oops, wrong way. But very specific. Beard, uh, mustache, long hair. Who has long hair like that? Not the Greeks. Not Greeks anymore, that is to say. Um, what else is Greek about it? About the mausoleum at Halicarnassus. So, so the figure, there are things about him that are Greek. There are things about him that are not Greek. right? His clothing... Definitely not Greek. Something else that's Greek about it. OK, something that's not Greek about it. What's not Greek about it? Were you going to say something that was Greek? Yeah. Something that's not Greek. Well, it has Greek sculpture, Greek artists, and Greek stories, but it's built to a certain Um, so it's, it's, it's built for an individual. It's very self-aggrandizing. On the other hand, we just looked at the Higa so steely. Of course, that's a temple. Those are, that, that is just for temples. So, so, so this, is, this is for um, you know, a, a grave monument. A grave monument. Have you seen any of those? No. Pyramidal structure. Is not Greek. There are parts of this that are Greek. The columns, the relief sculpture, but it's like parts that were taken out and mixed and matched with other things. So the great big square individual monument, not Greek. The pyramidal roof, not Greek. The adornment on the outside, Greek. The intention of the building, not Greek. The person for whom it's made, not Greek. The people who make it, probably Greek. And that all leads to this very interesting question. What do we mean when we say that something is Greek art? What do we mean when we say that something manifests Greek culture. Why does this matter? Because within 25 years of the death of Mausolus, which takes place in 353, Alexander the Great conquers the Eastern world. And we start a whole new period, the Hellenistic period. And there are many, many other cultures out there that are going to receive, interact with, change, absorb Greek culture, and the Greeks are going to receive and interact with them. And at some point, we are going to decide that the Greek culture that we have been tracking is going to morph into something else. So essentially, it's going to disappear. How are we going to know? We're only going to know if we decide what we think constitutes the essential items of Greek culture as it's been established over the 500 years or so that we've been studying since January. And that is what we will decide in discussion on Tuesday.